the last part of that second dream where Billy comes full circle, comes back to the farm and finds the cops there. They're looking for who's burying those dead horses. I'm back at the rural property that I was at in the beginning of the dream. Now I'm standing across the road from the main entrance of the man and his son's property. There's law enforcement cars on his property and down the road where I had buried the first horse. They had found other dead horses buried on their property and was doing an investigation. An investigator announced, I believe by two-way radio, I heard it. Um, an investigator announced that they had found another horse buried just off of the property, meaning the horse that I had buried earlier, they had found it. And they started leading his two sons past me on the road. So these, these were two um, 30 something year old sons. Um, and he, law enforcement had them grasped by the arms, walking them down the road right in front of me, going over towards where they had just found this other horse buried in the ditch. And um, as they came by me, I could tell that they wanted a piece of me, that, that I was the cause of the law enforcement showing up and discovering what they had been doing with these horses. Uh, when they came by me, the first one sneered at me and told me that they were going to get me for all the trouble that I caused them. And I got defensive in a stance like, like a linebacker would. I got, cause I thought he was ready to attack me and I got down to, you know, protect myself. And then he walked on. And then the second law enforcement officer with the second son came by and it was a repeat of the exchange, the same thing. He said the same thing, we're gonna get you, you know? And he acted like he was gonna come after me and I got down I'd relaxed just for a second. I got down in my defensive stance again. Um, and then um, they turned as they walked away. And they, so as they were walking away, they both turned and looked back at me and said, they're going to come back to get me later. And then that was the end of the dream. Did it freak you out? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I mean, in in the dream, it did. Yeah. But once once I woke up, you know, I yeah. was I, I knew it was all a dream, so <laughs> I didn't have any residual feeling from it. Um, although um, I knew that this was one of the dreams I definitely wanted to record and and learn more about, so I could I could learn from it um, because it. Uh, and, you know, I've had horses and dreams before and you had to do a lot, uh, you know, has to do with will. Um, but there was things in this dream that I didn't understand the poison, uh, having, uh, you know, old friends that were close family uh, at the time that I had never dreamed about in the dream. So I wanted to discover more about it. I made sure I got I got up right away and typed up both of these dreams. Yeah, which was smart because you would not have remembered all the details. Usually, I mean, usually I can. Lately, I've been having an issue where um, I wake up after a dream um, and I remember it. And and as you know, because I've shared with you in the past, I, I because I practice this so much, I really don't have to stop in the middle of the night and jot down any notes about a dream to remember it. Uh, I, I really don't. I can go over to my head just a couple of times and then go back to sleep. And sleep is very, very important for me. And I know that if I get up and I start writing or typing something down, that it'll take me longer to go back to sleep. So I, I commit a few of the points of memory. Um, lately, I've been having some trouble with that. Like, after these two dreams, I had several nights where I had smaller, shorter dreams where 
I remembered it when I woke up during the middle of the night, but by the morning, I couldn't remember it any longer. Or, um, and part of that has to do with um, the next mornings having to get up to go to work where the alarm would go off at 3.30 in the morning. And I, I would be in the middle of a dream when the alarm would go off and then everything would just go poof. Yeah. Um, it's one of the banes for a you know, dream interpreter is that exactly what you're yeah. talking about. Yeah. So, you know, what strikes me at the end of this dream, the second dream is that you have, in the first dream, you had the two medical guys, the doctors. Mm -hmm. And in this, you have two law enforcement people, right? And they're both males too. Right. Yeah. So the first one is about your healing and authority there. This one is about your. Okay. Now, Dr. Barber is going to show the difference between authority and healing and authority and discipline, which is the comparison between Billy's first dream and this dream. Authority there. This one is about your authority with discipline. And they're the ones that are finding all the dead horses. So it's the discipline in you. You got to remember that there's the tendency for the external authority to resist, you know, resistance in order to move. But if there's resistance and there's fear. So the dreams, I think, when you look at the whole picture of it, is an image of where you are with moving from fear into love. You know, the love is the two element. It's the duality. It's the yin and the yang. And they're meant to work together to create, which makes a three. So you're very much looking at taking stock of where you are, what you've done, um, where you're going. And so the thing I probably would look at the most, if it was my dream, is I would be self-reflective of what I want to call guilt, because it sounds like with the, the powder and that you were set up, those kinds of thoughts in the dream, that there's something that you are holding on to that possibly a regret that is getting in your way now. It's getting in the way of, of, of this um, crossing over, of this, this transition. So, you know, I would look at, uh, it's a judgment day deal, personally, you know, that you're doing that has nothing to do with physically dying. It has to do with an opportunity to work through this thing so that you don't dump it into the afterlife when you really do leave this world, right? So we have opportunities all the time to heal ourselves, literally, to be able to transcend so we can get to the point of creating. So I think it's really, uh, the whole movement is beautiful in instructions, not just you know affirmation and compliment, uh, complimenting you and that kind of thing of progress, but actually, giving you the full scope, like a map almost, you could do a mind map out of this dream, the two dreams, that then we will want to revisit, you know, several weeks ahead when you get to the 108, let's just, t let's plan to do that. That when, when we're done with the 108, we meet again, you'll have different dreams, certainly we'll, we will have talked about others, I'm sure, but um, to see what you think about the dream, you know, because that's a lot of it in life. And that's the beauty of being a, a, a scribe with your dreams, a journalist with your dreams, mm -hmm. is that you can look back. And when you look back at a dream, you can see things in that dream that you didn't have eyes for at the time. You know, you didn't have the experience and understanding yet to see that bigger picture. It's also important too, one other thing I wanted to bring up was the first dream, um, you're, in, you're in large spaces, you're at the hospital, which is a place of healing, that's universal mind too, because there's so many different people with the intent of healing. Then you go to the mall and the mall is commerce. It's giving and receiving, sharing, interaction, things like that, values, looking at values. So everything was like, it was very much that. In the second dream, it's all much more personal. It's rural, it's not in the city. So it's very much personal. The people that you know, even though you haven't seen them for a long time, they're, they're very personal, they're bloodline people, that kind of thing. And so there's that contrast between dream one and dream two, that when you look at them together, 
which is the work you're probably going to be doing with OM, is my guess. You're going to be putting those together in ways that you haven't before. And so it's setting you up, it's setting you up to drop the fear. Because I think that the fear is where the guilt rises from, that you've done something wrong, that you're going to get in trouble, that you need to defend yourself because you didn't do anything wrong, that kind of thing. That's pretty. That's where the defensive postures came in. Yeah. So, you know, realize in as much as it does relate to your spiritual disciplines that you're starting on here and meeting that challenge, which always calls the will forward, you know, that this is a really wonderful beginning that this is encouraging you to drop, drop the past scenarios, the, the dead horses, you know, let the dead bury the dead, as Jesus said, let it go, you know, no fear here, no judgment like has been your tendency earlier in your life. Mm -hmm. Replace it with love and compassion for you. Yeah. 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 Appreciate you sharing. It's going to, it's going to be very helpful to a lot of people, I think. Well, you know, too, when you when you just mentioned that, it made me think of um, another thing I was thinking about sharing that first night in our Sunday night uh, Zoom call that I did not until Wednesday, but I was thinking about it, is the, um, uh, the webinar that I watched, the interview with um, the psychologist that um, had done a lot of studying of... Um, centenarians in blue zones where that the the biggest single connection between 100 percent of the 100 year olds was their outlook on life and their out and, and the basis of their outlook on life started with the foundation of self-love you know, and I was thinking about sharing that on Sunday night, never really got the opportunity. And I said, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to do that later and decided the next day that I would do that on our Wednesday night call, which I did. So. It's beautiful how it all works together, doesn't it? It, does, it is. It is. Yeah. It's, uh, it's just stunning. Uh, some of the studies on the centenarians, like you're talking about, uh, one of the ways and the way, way that I wrote about verse opinion was the, the number one thing was a sense of optimism, which is the same thing you're talking about, because optimism mm -hmm. comes from um, it's, it's hopefulness. Yes, but optimism is is proactive on the love, you know, so it's it's making your love real. And that, you know, that requires rewiring. It did for me uh, because I was raised with a lot of fear and well-meaning fear. You know, people didn't want me to be hurt. You know, they want me to stay out of the street, things like that. So the way that they gave it to me was pretty fearful, you know? And so I, I undid a lot of that when I had my son, particularly when I had my son, you know, in the early years, it was like, I really did a study on rewiring things because I didn't want to carry forward the sins of the father, you know, our mother onto my offspring. And I think that's true of most people. I don't think that they want to do that either. So it requires not getting myopic with the wounds and the fears and what your parents did to you and that kind of thing. It requires letting that go, you know, changing those murky waters into clear water so that you can think differently. And that's where the optimism comes in. Then you want, you want to live. You're not always looking for death everywhere. You know? Right. And, and that's, uh, you know, he gave several examples in there of the optimism um, and, and the thought process uh, that these centenarians have. And the two that come to mind is um, he was complimenting one uh, that was, you know, it was over 100, 203 years old that had just planted a garden a year before. And he was saying how beautiful his garden was. And the man said, yes, he says it is. He said, but wait till you see it a few years from now. You know, he wasn't planning on, you know, I might not make it until the second crop or anything. You know, he's like, it's going to be, it's beautiful now, but it's, it's going to be so much beautiful in a few years. And the other one was uh, um, 
uh, gentleman, he, and, and he prefaced this, but he said, I know this is going to sound chauvinistic. He said, but this is what the man told me. He said, it's so beautiful. Um, shortly after he turned 100 years old, this man became blind and had zero sight. And now he was like 103, 104. And he was asking him, he said, how do you feel about not having your sight any longer? He said, well, he says, you know, at first he said it was kind of depressing for a few months. He said, but I got over it. Um, he says, you, and he says, you know, the most remarkable thing about this now, he says, when I meet a woman, because I can't see them, they let me touch them all over. <laughs> Truly. <laughs> so I can, I can feel what they look like. And he was so excited about that. He had just totally flipped it. It is so beautiful, isn't yeah. it? I know, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and that's really the will factor. You know, the will factor gives us the ability to look at something and, and to make anything out of it that we want to. And well, we, it, it, it does. It does. And I'm conscious of that on, on a daily basis. Um, you know, I, I, I work and... Um, part-time job close to live um, in one of the big box hardware stores or our home improvement stores. Um, and I work with a group of people. Some have good attitudes, some have neutral attitudes and some have bad attitudes, you know, and, and I'll say good morning to people, you know, how are you doing? Well, I'm, I'm doing okay, you know, or, and, and, and some do it with enthusiasm, do not. And the ones that do not, sometimes I tell them, it depends on the relationship I have with them, um, you know, and, and I'll tell them I'm doing great, you know, and they say, well, that's good for you. And I'm like, it's a conscious choice. It is a choice, you know, and I've been, um, I've consciously chosen to feel good too. Um, and I realize now it's a conscious choice and, and I, um, I don't go there very often, you know, to where, you know, I constantly choose to, add. And, and I do have the awareness now that when I do start going down that road, I can stop it. Say, wait a minute. And that's reflected this, in your this. dreams. Yeah, it really is. It's reflected definitely in these dreams. Yeah, it reminds me too of, of a Chinese proverb that probably is in other cultures too, which is, and it's widely quoted, that the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago, and the second best time is today, now. So, you know, that's, right. that's a really good philosophy. That's a really good philosophy of mine. So, thank you so much for sharing your dreams. Well, thank, thank you, you for Thank you for being who you are. What you were all about. So. <laughs> Yeah, it'll be good. It will be excellent. Sat yeah. yeah. Okay, that's the end of dream two. Next is going to be dream number three. And that one has a lot to do with thieves stealing bicycle parts. So keep an eye out for that one. <laughs>